Hey everybody, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of Down to Earth. My name is Harriet Kamak. I'm the host of this podcast. And today on our podcast, we're going to talk about something that I think is deeply personal, some sort of internalized grief at the collective loss that we as a community are enduring here in America. I believe this speaks to the fact that it's largely overlooked because it's not affecting the white power structure as much as it is affecting black America. So I'm going to take some time out of the politics of the day to talk about what matters to black Americans today and how are we dealing with grief. And at the end of this, I'm going to uh, give you a number to call for anyone you know who might be experiencing some sort of grief. I, I know it's real because I myself have had to talk myself off this the ledge liberally. I myself, uh, during the coronavirus, at the height of it, the pandemic, when I learned that people whom I know personally uh, had contracted the virus and the collective grief surrounding some of them had passed and some luckily were still here by the mercies of God, and I began to watch on my Facebook page, as so many people uh, began to announce the passing of their re- their friends and relatives. And it, it became a moment when I began to realize that this was collective and that this grief was not just happening here in Detroit, but it was nationwide. And so pe- black people, wherever we gathered in our groups and in our communities, would be mourning, exacerbated by the fact that we couldn't mourn together because of the virus. We couldn't hug one another. We had to contend with virtual uh, funerals and uh, we had to contend with the fact that we couldn't perform the usual rituals associated with grief. But I'm going to come back to that. But the politics of the day today are also contributing to our grief. The politics of the day today is Monday, October 5th, and a few days ago, Friday evening, we watched as the President of the United States was taken to the hospital, was airlifted to the hospital because he had contracted the coronavirus. Notwithstanding the fact that he had become a super spreader himself, that he must have known he had it, the White House is dumpling it, they have no credibility, and they don't seem to care that they have no credibility. They want a second term, but you have no credibility ending the first term. So how are you going to get a second term on what will people believe? It's just crazy how people govern as if they're in a bubble and that you're not part of an apparatus. A government is an apparatus and a machinery, the machinations of which are unending as it continues throughout its various structures into into our communities. They just think that the White House is the be all and the center of the government and that's it. So they had no idea when they were posing all these pose photographs and staging all these photo ops in the midst of a pandemic that you're alienating a group of people. The people who are standing outside the Walter Reed Hospital are paid promoters. Those people are people who are paid to be there. The White House and this government, this administration has a machinery that pays people to show up at rallies because they you have no credibility. I believe you pay people to stand outside Walter Reed Hospital. Those are not regular folks because the people who have contracted coronavirus, if you read Twitter and Facebook, the people who have lost family members don't have time to stand outside of the hospital to wave on a president who has, through his carelessness, has contributed to the loss of their loved ones. So let's be clear about that. So that's the politics of today. So politics, we can't, typically we would say politics aside, but this grief that black Americans are going through is politicized and is in fact caused by the politics of the day. It's not unusual for us to lose loved ones. I mean, we all have lost loved ones. In 2017, my mom died. In 2018, I think I was spared. Uh, in 2019, my father died and my cousin within 10 days of each other. 
a resounding grief that I still think affected me deeply and intrinsically. I'm not alone. There are many of us who have lost loved ones. But this year, in 2019, we found ourselves mourning the loss of people who should never have died from a virus. It's one thing, as the doctors say, to have comorbidities or to have pre-existing conditions, such as high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, uh, high cholesterol. Those are comorbidities. Those are health factors that contribute to one's demise. So it is one thing for our family members to have had that, and those are caused by systemic racism, racism in healthcare. We could go on and on about pointing out the inequities in the, in the healthcare system. But combined with a virus, an out of control virus that we knew nothing about, that the administration was reluctant to apply remedies to and reluctant to apply the full force of the United States government with all its resources to address it naturally impacted black and brown communities the most. I find myself at the nexus of such because I'm black and brown. My ancestors are from Africa, but they're also from Europe. I also have ancestors who are Cuban, who were Spanish, then lived in Cuba. So I have ancestors from both sides of the pendulum. So because I'm a member of the black and brown community, not just by sight, by looking at me, but intrinsically and and ethically and ethnically, this impacted my community and the resounding effects as I watch my own community members fall into the chaos that erupted from the pandemic. It's unbelievable. It's untold grief. I can't begin to tell you how many people I have inboxed on Facebook who, having expressed desires of giving up, have had to intervene, quickly inbox, to give them a phone number to provide hope, a phone number to call someone if you need to talk to someone. I've given my phone number out. Call me if you feel like talking. While at the same time, I am grieving. At the same time, I'm talking to two people in my immediate community who got sick from the virus, two contributing members of the Detroit community whom I wouldn't want to lose and a lot of people would not want to lose. And I had to ask myself, what about the people who are losing moms and pop pops and aunties and uncles and cousins and play cousins and friends whom you grew up with? friends who became family and your family it is unbelievable so we're titling this episode the relentlessness of black grief and grief in this country has always had an equity problem and 2020 has only amplified the issue as black deaths have come in back-to-back blows from the coronavirus police brutality and the natural deaths of those whom we revere the most in june a washington post poll found that nearly one in three black Americans know someone who personally has died of COVID-19. The death rate among black individuals is up to 10 times higher than among white Americans. We have lost mothers, fathers, siblings, uncles, aunties, pop pops, nanas, play cousins, friends, and neighbors as the pandemic ravages our community. We have a tsunami of grief on of, of grief and mental health on our hands. Uh, The elections are gonna be very telling in a lot of ways. It's gonna tell us how many black Americans actually felt that they were invested in the process itself to come out and vote. Most people feel as if, what is the point in voting when I don't, it doesn't change anything. And when we look at what systemic racism has done and how institutionalized racism has contributed to police brutality to black Americans and how systemic and institutionalized racism has contributed to inequities in healthcare and racism in healthcare. It is very hard to make the stand and to make the contribution or to even inspire a conversation to why should black Americans who are poor and who have often been distanced 
from the economy and who are not reaping rewards from the feel good of the economy or the stock market surges, why should they feel they should vote for another white man? Why should they feel that they should vote? And more importantly, what will be different when they vote? It's a hopelessness that has come over the black community. And I'm gonna give you why, we all know why. We, we, we knew these things existed before 2020 happened. We knew that there were inequities in racism. We knew that institutionalized racism has robbed us of our economic standing in America. We know that as a result of slavery and the enslavement of black Americans and Jim Crow and the March for Civil Rights has not done much to fundamentally shift economic power to black Americans. We knew that. We understood that. We knew that. I don't know that we accepted it, but we were living with it, hoping and systemically working at changing it by having conversations on racial justice, having conversations on violence, and having conversations on these impacts. Then came the pandemic. And the pandemic opened the spotlight and shunned the spotlight on what racism in healthcare looks like. Right now we're watching a president who is a white man enjoying the best healthcare, getting access to treatments that black Americans and ordinary Americans never got a chance. He's 74 years old and he's getting experimental treatments provided by the federal government. Whereas black Americans and regular Americans who were diagnosed at the same age as he is and who were diagnosed with COVID did not receive the same grace, did not receive the same experimental treatments, did not receive any kind of treatments that would have prolonged their lives. That's inequity. That's inequity. Whether you're, if you're white, it's inequity. And if you're black, it's racism. And so when you look at this, you have to look at the pandemic as a single damning factor that has caused the tsunami of mental health unwellness among black Americans. What the pandemic did was open the system up and a whole can of worms spilled out that reminded us that we were former enslaved people. And that despite the advancement of the abolition of slavery, despite the fact that Jim Crow laws in some states have been abolished, that inequities in healthcare exist, inequities in education exist, inequities in criminal justice exist, inequities in education exist, inequities in housing exist, inequities in the economy exist. And so we're reminded again of the grief of our ancestors passed down through time. We call it intergenerational trauma. We watched as the pandemic robbed us of people whom we loved. The pandemic robbed us of grieving properly. We couldn't just go to the funeral in the black community. It's called a home going. If you've ever been to a home going in a, in a black funeral, you know what I'm talking about. You, you would think that it's a send off <laughs> back to the ancestors, I kid you not. There are plates of food and everybody leaves with a covered plate of food. It's part of the grief, it's part of the mourning, it's the rituals. We, we get to hug each other. We get to sing songs that prop us up and help us to deal with the fact that we have lost someone, that a loved one, a friend, someone we cared about, someone whose presence we will miss has received their wings. We were robbed of that because of the pandemic. Then the pandemic raged on and we began to realize that, wait a minute, it's disproportionately affecting black Americans. What's the deal here? We began to realize that black and brown members of our community were disproportionately impacted by this. And we got to understand that, wait just a minute, it reminded us and turned the spotlight onto racism in healthcare as more and more stories 
of black people showing up at emergency rooms who were very sick but who were sent home by white doctors and white nurses to tell them to go home and wait it out. Go home and take an aspirin, go home and take a Tylenol and you will feel better whereas white people who show up with the same symptoms were hospitalized. We began to see that pre-existing conditions that we know were common to our people and we probably just put it down to well they they don't eat as well as they should mom and dad could not you know could have eaten better but then we began to realize that they eat the way they do because that's the extent of their resources they lack education and nutrition and by the time they learned to change those habits had already been formed so they became a victim of their habits their habits contributed to high blood pressure sometimes we found that people black people are diagnosed later for high blood pressure and and diabetes much slower than white people are diagnosed they're not given the right drugs in fact in my experience i found that there's one drug for high blood pressure gosh n- n- um lisinopril that should have been was withdrawn by the FDA. They rebranded it under a different name. But that same drug lisinopril is still available on the market. It contributes to strokes and cancer. I kid you not. And it's still available and it's being distributed to the black population. A friend of mine had a stroke and she ended up in the hospital. And when I called her, I said, "What kind of meds are you taking?" because it sounds like the medication is the problem and she said no my doctor says just just humor me and when she said listen to prela said that drug has been off the market when i lived in florida it was off the market and she said no my doctor would never ever give me like that i have the be- i said go and ask your doctor why you are being given listen to prela said you have your phone with you i called her in the on the hospital phone i said i will wait pick up your phone and put listen to prela in the Google search engine on your phone. And tell me what comes up. She did. There was silence. It was radio silent. You know what happened? Intergenerational trauma. The fact that she now realized that her doctor is white and that her doctor prescribed her a medicine that he knew had been withdrawn from the market but still gave it to her emphasized to her the inequities and the racism in healthcare. She was reluctant to admit it to me. It wasn't about admitting it to me. I understood her reasoning. I would have been upset too. I would have been upset at the messenger to understand that despite all of this, I'm still being treated according to the color of my skin. Now you could say, well, Harriet, maybe she lacked exposure. No, she has two master's degrees in counseling, so she's not uneducated. She just didn't know that lisinopril was off the market. She just trusted her physician. Listen to that. Trusted her physician to not prescribe her a medication that is likely to cause a morbidity. Are you hearing me? She called the doctor and asked him to change it. Do you know what happened? Are you ready for that? When she asked him to change the medication because he was giving her the hospital version of it because the drugs they give you in the hospital is different from the ones you get to take home. When she when he changed the medication, guess what? Her blood pressure that was precipitous dropped. All of a sudden she could be discharged and sent home. I said from now on, whenever they write you a prescription, a write any medication, look it up. She said, "Why do you know?" I said, "Because my ex-husband was that was uh had high blood pressure. And at the time, I made sure that whatever medication he was going to take, I knew more about it. So whenever they you know the little stuff that is attached to the medication, when I see it, the first thing I'm reading is what is it made of? I can't pronounce half of it. But I'm looking for the side effects and it's dr- the interactions with other drugs. And if it has certain side effects and certain interactions, I'm like, call your doctor. You can't take this because it's going to interfere with something else you're taking. This is what happens to black Americans. We're not treated as if we're human when we go to the doctor. We are not treated like we're a scientific experiment either because then they would have had some respect for the outcome and some appreciation for our contribution to science. 
what they do is they mistreat us simply based on the color of our skin. The medical profession is riddled with racism. It doesn't matter what the ethnicity of the doctor is. If he's South Asian, whether he's Indian, Pakistani, or from the Middle East, he's just as racist as the white ones. They all are racist, the hatred. The, see, the colonialism mentality never left, the colonial mentality, where white people taught people that being white is superior. Therefore, anybody who has non-white skin and anybody who is of African descent, because that's what the problem is, is treated as if you are subhuman. When we look at this, the pandemic just suddenly erupted and opened all of this and threw it back in our faces for us to deal with. Now we can hear our ancestors and understand the pain of the enslaved man and woman and how they must have felt when they had no autonomy, no choices over their outcome, no choice over where they were. They had no income because they were not paid for their income, even though they contributed to the wealth of the community and contributed to the wealth of the country, we still have no equity in the said country. This tsunami of mental unwellness is troubling. Yes, it's very troubling. Because now we are facing the grief of our ancestors all over again, coupled with our grief. We have young people graduating college with master's degrees who are earning $15 an hour. Excuse me? Workers at McDonald's, and I'm not putting anybody down, are on the front line and they are standing in the rain and the snow and they feel that they should earn $15 an hour. But you, somebody who is educated, you want to start them off for $15 an hour for 25 to 30 hours a day, a week, to pay back said student loans. But the white person is getting better paid. Talk about racism. So we watch the pandemic as it raged on. We watch as the current administration painted a picture that, well, since this is happening in blue states and it's mostly happening in, amongst black people, then we don't have to do anything about it. They cussed and funneled and fumbled their feet about issuing a stimulus check. They fussed about making broad scale. They want to discredit Obamacare and repeal Obamacare Meanwhile, the president is enjoying the best health care. The senators are enjoying the best health care provided and afforded by the federal government on the backs of black Americans. The president is living in the White House built by enslaved people. He's living in the house built by enslaved people while at the same time having federal officers shoot on our protesters in Washington, D.C. and in Portland, Oregon. We have to sit back and watch all of this and internalize that in America, being black is dangerous to the extent where we start telling our children, don't go out. We'd call our children and say, you need to head home. Don't be out late. Don't be out dark. When it gets dark, come home. We start re-messaging to our children something white children never have to contend with or put up. There is racism. Not to, it just didn't happen during the pandemic. We had to watch police brutality. Oh my God. Like that's all we kept saying. Oh my God. Over and over we watched as people who look and sound like us get beaten with their heads, with police officers, knees on their necks, get shot in the back, get shot while jogging beaten and killed and being shot in the hallway of your own home by a rage of police bullets. You have to ask yourself, what if? We've lost so many people this year. The year started out with Kobe. I don't wonder Kobe's wife is suing the helicopter company. I don't blame her. She lost her husband. He was worth a lot of money to her. We watched as we lost Kobe. We've lost so many people who, for us, were our champions and our heroes. We lost Kobe. We lost Chadwick Bowman, a number of, of great uh, athletic greats. We lost Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Richard Brooks. 
we lost John Thompson. We lost the irreplaceable John Lewis, Reverend Vivian, Reverend C.T. I mean, it was just like, man, give us a break somehow. We lost Herman Cain. We disagreed with his politics, but he was invited to participate at the COVID super spreader event, knowing that it was dangerous to people like him who had a pre-existing condition. He had a pre-existing condition as a cancer survivor. Within three weeks of attending the rally in Tulsa, we now call it the Tulsa massacre. He was dead. No regard for black Americans whatsoever. We're watching as we lost our jobs in the pandemic because by and large, black and brown people are the essential workers. They're the people who clean our homes. They're the people who clean the streets. They clean toilets. They clean the streets. They cook in restaurants. They serve in restaurants. Yes, essential workers who have to get up in the mornings and make deliveries. They drive trucks and deliver trucks. They pack the deliver trucks. Essential workers in supermarkets who had to stand there in the midst of a pandemic and make sure we cashed out our groceries. By and large, black and brown people made up the bulk of that. You know what that also meant? Not only were they duly exposed, unduly exposed to COVID-19, they didn't have health insurance. Stringent laws and draconian policies of public officials, especially in Republican-controlled Senates and Republican-controlled legislatures across the country, resulted in many black and brown people not having something as common as health insurance. My God. So we're watching that. We're sitting on watching. And it didn't matter what kind of black you are. Whether you are in Hollywood in a multi-million dollar mansion or whether you are just downstate, you are watching it and you're like, my God, they don't care. They don't care about me. They don't care about my people. They never did, even though black Americans are the reason American America is wealthy because free unpaid labor contributed to us may being the South and the Southern economy in 1870 being worth $3 billion. That's what set the stage for America, America's greatness economically. Black Americans, unpaid labor, black Americans viewed as chattel, as property, and as property, as human cargo, were deemed more valuable than land, consequently, but never reaped the benefit, never got paid. Their descendants to this day have not been paid. We watched natural deaths. I mean, people are going to die naturally. But that's one thing on a regu- in a regular year. Yeah, we deal with that. But then the old injustices started coming to light. Here is a president who believes in making America great again. He pursues a policy of racial of white supremacy. He believes whites are superior. He encourages the police to beat up black Americans. He does not cry down systemic racism. So his supporters continue to perpetrate old injustices. He seemed insensitive about it because he was looking for political gain. So we saw old injustices begin to arise. And guess what? It affected us because now we are like, dang, that's what our ancestors went through. And here's the thing that's more damning. They went through it, and we are going through it. All of a sudden, being black is not fun. It never was. But we're looking at it like, this is a centuries-old problem that has reared itself again. We need to do something about making sure this goes away permanently. That in, therein is the fight. For most white Americans, you know, they're told like, ask your black friends, how do they feel? Or your black coworkers, how do they feel? You don't want to do that. How do we, why am I supposed to be responsible for your answer to that question? I don't give a fig how you feel. Your ancestors did it. It's time you pay up is my attitude. 
What are you going to do about it? Because at the end of the day, you are protected by a system that makes sure you win economically. By a system that if I apply for a job and you apply for a job, you get it. By a system that if I apply for a mortgage and you apply for a mortgage, you get a lower interest rate. By a system that when you show up at the emergency room, even though I am an author and a speaker and I'm a medical doctor and I'm a, I'm a scientist and I'm a lawyer, I'm a prosecutor, I'm a judge. Even though I show up at an emergency room, doesn't matter what my title or my occupation is. It's my black skin that determines whether I get treated or not. Though you might just be a construction worker, but you are going to be treated better based on the color of your skin. So the old injustices raised up and we are like, oh my God. My friends, this is what we have been dealing with. So when you look at all of this, then the pandemic raged on. We lost our jobs. We're always the last hired and the first fired. So the pandemic raged on. We lost our jobs. I'm laying out the case for you. We lost our jobs, lost our way of life. So we're not getting a job because there's a pandemic out there, despite the fact that Republicans, these old injustices, Republicans raised up again and said, well, we shouldn't give anybody any more stimulus because that just encourages them to stay home because they're lazy. Sounds familiar, something our ancestors used to hear. Sounds familiar? Yeah, it's an echo to Jim Crow. The South never died, y'all. The South lives on to these public policies perpetrated on folks in Louisiana and Mississippi through gerrymandering and redlining. The South never died. They just found a new way to do business. And we still sit there and we're like, how many black adjunct professors do you know? Several. They don't receive tenure. They don't receive the benefits of being tenured. Occasionally you come across a white one and they're like, well, I'm white and I'm an adjunct from head of Sit down and shut up. Because if you go apply for a job at another college, you're going to get it, but the black person won't get it. So sit yourself down. This is not about you. This is about righting a wrong that is centuries old and that must be fixed. So you look at, then the pandemic continued. It never stopped y'all. It continued in education, the school shut down. Typically black and brown communities are poor. So you're not gonna find people with internet access. They might have cable so they can watch TV, but internet is a luxury. So they might have a phone that can access the internet, but on a sustained basis to be able to have wireless internet come into your home so you can access educational programs now being distributed is unbelievable. And you have people in school districts sitting there. Uh, We don't have any budget for education. But how do you find the money to give to white schools? Amazingly, students in Utah each got a computer during the pandemic to make sure they could do their homework with built-in wireless internet in Utah, the state of Utah. Utah is a state in the United States. It's predominantly white. But they got, the students all got what they needed. But where black and brown communities exist, it's a fight. These students are going to face an inequity in education in the years to come. Some studies suggest that it may, they may be delayed by a year. I tend to think it's going to take about two to three years to recover. We had to watch that. Many black and brown people were renters. Notice I said were because evictions are continuing across the country as politicians, even democratic politicians, are caving into public pressure from big donors who are saying, I need these people out of my apartment so I can rent it, out of my structure so I can rent it. And you know what the federal government is doing? They're sitting back and saying there's no systemic racism, there's no pandemic, there's no coronavirus, it's not affecting anybody, and it's all made up. I guess that's why the president had to get it for him to see that it is real. All of these things have contributed to our trauma. So you look at people 
who are isolated because we can't, our connections, we just realized now how important it was for us to be connected, how important it was for us to go out and socialize. Going to work is, was not just work to provide money, but it was also what? Occupational therapy. You had a connection with the people you worked with. You get to go out, you buy coffee or buy tea or whatever it's your beverage, but you get to interact with people. The isolation from the coronavirus has driven people crazy. Then you lose your job. So you are out of touch with your network. So how are you going to find a job? You have to go back home to live with people who are in the same boat as you. And you're all sitting in the house, can't find work, can't get unemployment because the the, 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 the Republican senators refuse to negotiate and shut down because they're mad that they're losing an election, <laughs> that they're going to lose handsomely. And they're mad as anything. They're mad as all get out. They said, we're not going to help anybody. And so you are at home with other people. Of course, tempers rise. And we're all facing this collective grief. The root cause of the problem is not him unemployed or she unemployed. The root cause of the problem is the systemic racism that caused all of this to impact our community. And guess what? We have less resources available to us. One in three black Americans know someone who died from COVID. Do you know that this fallout, let me read it carefully so you know, the death rate amongst black individuals from coronavirus is 10 times higher than among white individuals. 10 times higher. Just saying that is enough to spike you. Jesus, the systemic inequities We watch police brutality and the filming of black deaths. It hurts. And there is no relief from being black in America. None whatsoever. I like to say that we're all in the same boat. Living in a world filled with sorrow. We have to find ways to cope. So we start looking inward because we don't even have the luxury to grieve. We can't afford to grieve because if you start grieving, then they start giving you a problem. We, we, we don't have health care, so we can't go to a therapist to talk for the love of God. We, we don't have resources that can help us. You know what? I'm just going to tell you all right now. In the name of everything that is good, in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, everything that is good. I'm going to tell you all this right now. Go to the dollar store, get yourself a coloring book and get some pencils. Color your way out of this. Draw some pictures. Remember when we were kids and they used to put us in a little sandbox and then after that they would tell you to go draw something, draw what home looks like or draw a sun, a moon and stars. Draw and color your way out of this. It's the cheapest form of therapy, I'm going to tell you. We're all overburdened because we're absorbing so much angst. You know, in today's world, when people start losing it and going postal, all of us tend to go quiet because we're like mass shooting incident. Is that potentially so? But when you start looking at people's griefs and their faces, you begin to realize that it's collective. You begin to realize that it's accumulative, that people are just tired. We're just overwhelmed. They're just tired. They don't know where they're going to go. I was reading a story yesterday on Twitter where a woman said that, she was serving a guy who needed a cup of coffee and he had only cash. And she said her restaurant has a policy where it's now accepting only card payments, but he needed a cup of coffee. So when he gave her the, the dollar bill, she had to give him back change and she did, she couldn't find it to give him and he became agitated. And so she herself started looking for change to give him back. And then turns out he's homeless. So she wrote on Twitter saying, well, what's what's that going to be like? I mean, if they're saying we're moving to a cashless society, how is the homeless going to cope when that's all they have is cash and coins? So we're grieving and we have no outlet. We're grieving from all these police brutality deaths that according to what we saw with George Floyd, the cop delighted in making sure we saw that he had the power over George Floyd, that he had the power to put his knee for eight minutes long. And no matter what the EMTs were saying, he still had the power to do it. 
It's like shoving it in our faces the same way they did it with our ancestors, the same way they're doing it now. So we, all this has created is a tsunami of grief. And, and you can't, there are not enough, even the mental health counselors who are black are having the same problems because you're, they're black just like you and I. They have to deal with this just like you and I. We're all overtaxed. We're all overburdened. And we can't get out because the coronavirus is back so we can go ride a horse or go hiking or go somewhere else. Some people are like, man, I'm just gonna go to, I'm just gonna go on vacation just to get away, just to get away. And I'm like, what is it gonna cost when you come back? I'm like, stay in my house. I am tired. So you go for a walk. So I have learned to tone it down. I tune it out when I can. I try not to, I watch shows on TV channels and so on, and I just tune it out. Sometimes I just get in the car and go for a drive and bump some music. Those are the ways in which I find myself coping today. I cook comfort food. I'm amazed that I haven't gained weight during this pandemic, but maybe I work out more. I don't know. I find that clinging to my routine is helping me cope. So I work out just to release endorphins that may simulate you feeling good. See what I mean? Please refrain from taking drugs because it's not going to help us because then we develop another problem that we have to deal with. And you already know, we don't have many resources in our community to address these systemic inequities in healthcare. Help us. Oh God, we watch the president in complete disregard for everyone around him. Took a ride yesterday, riddled with the coronavirus and took a ride in an SUV that is hermetically sealed against a chemical attack and no social distancing inside. And he took a ride just so he can wave to supporters because his ego is more important. Jesus, for the love of God, our ancestors, our cousins, our grandparents died at 69 and 70 from the coronavirus. Help us. We live in a day and time when being black is dangerous in America. And you know what we've come to realize? That it's always been that way. We just, put a thing over our eyes so we wouldn't see how bad it was just so we could cope and during this year of 2020 we begun to see the veil just slid off our eyes like it just melted in the face of the systemic racism that we've had to live through many of us are trying to cling to normalcy in our own way trying to cling to i i'm black i'm rich i have economic power I want to give the appearance that I'm still in charge because you can't face the possibility that you will become like other blacks whom you see the police pull over and brutalize because you used to think that having money kept you away from that. Then you realize it's all about the color of your skin. You don't want to face that. We watch as our livelihoods slip away. Black businesses rendered impotent, no help in sight. The federal government is blind to the plight of black and brown Americans. You watch voter suppression right before our eyes in Texas, the governor of Texas. Voter suppression as blatant as he knew knows how. In Florida, you watch as the governor shut off unemployment benefits to black and brown people who are unemployed in a pandemic when Florida's economy is based on tourism. And ain't nobody traveling in a pandemic. So the hotels are closed. The theme parks are closed. The places that normally accommodate thousands and millions of visitors are closed. And the governor of Florida shut it down. You got to wonder. You got to wonder, like, is there any end in sight? We're going to have to come together. And we're going to have to fight our way out of this one. We're going to have to hold on to our mental processes and we're going to have to treat and demand that our mental health be taken as just as importantly 
as our physical health, just like we're fighting wars on heart disease and we're fighting wars on high blood pressure and diabetes, we are going to have to fight for our mental health. I found myself saying that a couple of days ago that my mental health is more important than my physical health because where the mind goes, that's where the body goes. So I have to tell myself there are certain things I'm not going to allow to bother me. That's where we got to get to. We're going to have to start prioritizing what is important. I know many of us are facing homelessness. I know you're facing job loss and homelessness and you're like, what am I going to do? We're going to put one foot in front of the other. And we're going to have to grip ourselves just like our ancestors did. And I know you're saying, but Harriet, it's not supposed to happen. We did better. Our ancestors died that we might live and so on. Yes, that is true, but they don't want us to make it true. So in the meantime, while we're waiting to cross the Selma Bridge, while we're waiting to cross that bridge in Selma, we're going to have to hold on. We're going to have to steal ourselves one more time. We're going to have to tell ourselves we're going to get through this. So go to the doll store, buy yourself some coloring books, start coloring. Within the lines, out of the lines, it doesn't matter. Get yourself some cheap books and start writing how you feel. Yes, write it out. And I tell everybody, go get a pillow, go in your basement and and, and do something to that pillow just to shake it all out because you have to hold on to your mental stamina because you're going to need it to think through this. You're going to need it to re-strategize when this is over because this is going to pass. It's going to take a while, but it's going to pass. But when it does, you want to come out and emerge on the other side of this with your mental capacities intact. Then we can afford to grieve. Then we're going to grieve all the folks whom we lost during COVID. All the nanas. And I feel for you, all the pop-ups. I see all the pictures on Facebook. And I cannot begin to tell you how it hurts me. As much as you are hurting, I'm looking at the face of an ancestor. How much they meant to you. That they were the difference between life and death. They gave you continuity and something to hold on to. I feel your pain. But right now, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you to stay together. I need you to hold on. And at a time to come, we're going to get together and we're going to grieve. And it's going to be okay then to bawl and scream and cry. But right now, right now, I need you to hold on because we have to find housing for these kids. We have to find kids. to. We got to get to vote. We got to find housing for the kids. We got to find education for them. And we got to stay long enough in the fight so that by our numbers, they got to change the system that caused this in the first place. Change has to come. Barack Obama said some years ago that change has come. And he was saying it from the perspective that, from his perspective, and his legal standing as a president at the time and now he's a former president and a constitutional lawyer which he still is by the way he never lost his bar exams he never lost his standing to the the, the Illinois bar from his perspective he said change has come not change is going to come the change is happening what you're seeing in all these scenarios I've just outlined It's change. It's chaos. Change brings chaos. It's overturning the system that contributed to this in the first place and setting it right so that all will benefit. It's not for some, it's for all. And that, my friends, is the mindset that we must come out of this with. I bless you. In the name of Jesus, I pray wherever you are listening to this, that you will hold on and dig down deeper into ourselves. I know I'm asking too much. I am asking myself too much. But I'm going to ask you to learn to cope one more time. If you have to drink a glass of water, I'm crying as I say this because I know how painful it is 
right now. I spoke to someone yesterday who was at the end of their tether. I know how it is. I know. Because I am just like you. But I want you to hold on. Because change has come. I pray that you find peace. And I pray in the midst of this valley, in the midst of this, we're going to come out. Just give it a few more days. Give it until the end of the year. We're going to see the light. And we're going to start feeling better. And as the days come, it's going to change. And we are gradually, we're going to see it gets better. We need you to stand in the fight because we're going to have to stand up and advocate and continue talking about the change until we get the change that we must have. My name is Harriet Kimmick. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of Down to Earth. I know it's taken a long time, but the tsunami of grief that we're experiencing as Black Americans deserved our time and our attention today. Why don't you do me a favor? Go to my website, harrietkamen.com, as well as buy my book, Through the Fire. It's available on amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. Visit my pages on Anchor FM, Apple, Google Podcasts, and continue to stream us on iHeartRadio and on Spotify. Thank you so much, everybody. Be blessed. <music>